Hi, I'm Charlotte and I work for Platform and we are a third sector social change and mental health charity in Wales. And we changed a few years ago from being a traditional mental health service provider to a social change charity because we recognise that continuing to work in the way that we work was not always useful for the people we're trying to support. That And in fact, some of our behaviours as an organisation and as part of a big system was actually more harming than helpful. So some really sobering realisations for us, our practice, our organisational structure, our organisational culture, and seeing ourselves as part of a bigger system. And so we really wanted to share that kind of uh, view and challenge to each other, ourselves and the system with Wales. And so that's why we changed our mission. This title is deliberate because this is very much about allowing the future to emerge and leading from that realm. So what we've seen through coronavirus is there's far less predictability to how we do business, how we do life. We can no longer predict what's going to happen from the way that we've always done it because it's no longer the way that we've always done it. So now we're sitting in a place of uncertainty and we're needing to lead through uncertainty. And if you just pause on that for a second and think about how hard it is for you personally to sit with lack of control, how hard it is when we can, can't control our worlds, our relationships, our feelings, our income, our life, and personally what that throws up for us. And so then scale that up to what we're dealing with. And so the challenge of leading while sitting with great uncertainty as the future emerges, you know, is no mean feat. So I'm going to talk about bravery today. The obvious answer is we need brave leadership. So I'm going to talk about what does that mean? How do we actually create that? Is it even possible? And to recognise really that we have found a shared purpose. That's evident and been evidenced in many ways. But that purpose emerged from this crisis and so was not created by a fantastic mission statement or a no-brainer cost-benefit analysis, or an amazing uh, you know, set of lived experience stories, things that we have told and we have known and held in us for a long time, still didn't drive us to the huge sense of purpose that we have found uh, recently that has emerged from what was true in the collective. A different truth came within us, and so it's that truth from the collective that meant that a different purpose emerged and not something that was told to us to persuade us to be different from any evidence. And so I'm interested in us pausing on what were the conditions for that and what can we learn from the conditions for that to hold for the future. And actually now we need to emerge as leaders who can hold those purpose conversations that perhaps are more honest and more difficult than what we've had before. And another point that I'll be making, which I've already made, but is the personal and professional blurring of lines. Because I believe one of the reasons why the collective purpose emerged so dramatically and motivationally and wonderfully for people to find permission and creativity like never before to fix these problems was because it moved people very personally and there is a nugget there of of something that we can unlock that if we allow ourselves to feel things more personally then professionally a different future and solutions can emerge so no not news to you that siloed thinking even though we know it is a problem and we have the Future Generations Act that compels us, encourages us, offers us a new language and framework to work more collaboratively, integratively in a preventative way. That's great parlance in, in Wales now and is, uh, you know, recognised. But we also know that this still happens, that we have short termism, that we have reactionary funding, that we have spend all your money by March. Can you come up with an innovative idea 
in two months, spend all the money by March, please. Or we have uh, parameters on budgets that these are the parameters of my portfolio. So I only deal with domestic abuse and I don't deal with homelessness. Whereas in reality, that's not how people's lives work and that's not how people want to experience services very helpfully. The other cultural point here just to make is this is endemic of a broader cultural issue which is about division being on the rise amongst us all, everybody becoming more polarised. I'm not going to get into the politics of it but you will have felt it because we all have. So to just recognise some of that driving our behaviours in public life um, because because it, it, it's relevant to how we change this. So it is in the cultural context of individualism and consumerism anyway. We want to be more, we want to do more, because then we will be happy is how we behave in our lives. And that the, we are the same people who then come to work. And so there is no wonder then that despite all the stuff we know about collaboration, integration, prevention, etc., that our behaviour actually within those contexts and in those organisations is not always congruent with that. So a good example of this, and I'm going to talk about Margaret Wheatley's model a bit later on, but she talks about how we standards change things is gap analysis. So this is what's wrong. This is where we want to get to. Let's create an action plan. How do we fix it? Deficit thinking at its worst, because There is no cultural context to that. There is no taking people with you. There is no letting the solution emerge from the people within it. There is only a set of problems that need to be fixed. And therefore, the answer needs to be prescribed to those people. So very us and them thinking, us the expert prescribe to you, the lesser beings, how to get better and follow these steps. And if change happened like this, we wouldn't be having this conversation now because we would be the most compassionate leaders who run trauma-informed, compassionate organisations who are integrated and well involved, uh, well integrated into their communities. And the relationship between public services and communities would be entirely different if this worked. So we need something else. And this is what I'm trying to get us all to think about is how living systems come together according to their environmental needs. So we as human beings are living systems, as communities we're living systems, as organisations. So as people going about their lives, we are living systems. So So as I've already said, what emerges is a collective culture. So you cannot deconstruct what has emerged. You can't go, oh, that bit's wrong, take that bit out and change it with this. That's not how it will work. It will only emerge collectively what needs to happen. Okay, I'll bring more on this point later. So um, really important to build on this point really is about system change is an outcome and a process is the point. So it's not a destination, follow these action plans and we'll get there. To, to coin a you know terrible Simon Cowell phrase, it is about the journey, and the the people who are on that journey will change as we go along, and the answers that evolve will change as we go along. The process is continually iterative and iterative and continually changing, and that's the kind of uncertainty that we need to embrace. Which, when again, if you just pause for a minute and think about what I've said, and you think about running, for example, a, men- a mental health service with a three month waiting list, and you've got someone saying to you, you need to lead to be able to lead creatively and bravely, you need to be not be certain about what the outcome of the changes that you need to make. You know, you need to make changes, but you, you, you cannot purport to know what they are yet until you've listened properly taking people on that journey of solutions with you how unnerving that is so we launched a big listening exercise called lessons from lockdown where we listened to over 250 people in wales from over uh, from across different organizations third sector public services and so i'm going to talk to you now about the things that we found that i think uh, really led me to introduce it in the way that i did around system change that we really heard emergent leadership happening. So this movement to shift to what matters at speed 
And words like kindness and relationships coming from local authorities, talking about working with their key partners. So those are very relational, emotional terms, back to the point about bringing ourselves to leadership. And people talk about this very positively, that this was unlocking doors that they'd not previously been able to get through. And so people were able to prioritise purpose in a way that they hadn't before. And, and crucially, what we heard is this is was no longer about gluing together existing egos. I just really think that's an, a, such an important point. This isn't about trading off leaders' needs or needs to look good or manipulating to get what you want. It wasn't about doing that any longer, but it was about ideas being created in ways that hadn't before by people coming together in the, that moment. So there's key learning there. It was only because we were in that moment with those people around that table that those ideas emerged. It wasn't because we came with old ideas and our own agendas of needing to be seen to do things or succeed at things or win things or earn money for things that we that we got what we wanted. We got what we wanted by everybody in the room creating what was uh, needed. Purpose comes from what moves us, so it's deeply personal. So it's because we were moved personally that motivated us in a different way. So what what role is there for leaders in bringing purpose rituals to our work? How do we help people tap into their own motivations for being there, their own very personal reasons for being motivated to do a great job? What is our role as leaders there? And I've already alluded to this. So Sitting with suffering as a key skill came out very strongly. So leaders holding their teams through distress and uncertainty. And we really saw a difference between leaders who were able to do that on a very emotional level, on a very personal level, and those leaders who wanted to process it and create solutions and fix it. So there was a real disparity between lots of referrals to counselling services, not saying that's not a good thing, but what that communicated to staff was, you've got a problem and somebody else will fix it for you, not we are relating and connecting, I am hearing you and I am able to sit with you in your distress and hold you here enable feet for us to co-regulate together and find ways through this together. So uh, even as I'm saying it to you, you can probably hear that that, that feels quite scary to some leaders. Um, that feels like it's a lot to hold. And the person on the quote here certainly felt like it was a lot to hold. So again, for if you if we are going to work in this way, and I'm suggesting we should be, then the way our organisations run need to support this at a far deeper and broader level than they already do. And I'll go into some of that a bit more. Just thought it was really worth making the point that there is an irony here that we're talking about such emotional, emotive, personal issues, but yet we're doing most of this through a screen. So actually we heard that digital warmth existed and that meetings in fact felt more democratic, people feeling more included, people feeling heard. So as leaders that really needs to be heard by us that what is it when we get into a room that creates barriers that don't enable this? So what is it that we can do as leaders that keeps this culture alive? Just as a caveat, not everybody felt like this. And some people felt and still feel like um, seeing themselves reflected back through a screen is actually very stressful and distressing. Um, so, again, it's just about always being mindful of uh, how we are holding spaces for people because everybody is different and there won't be a one solution for everybody. So, of course, it wasn't all, you know, emotional warmth and literacy. It was also increased anxiety, loneliness. I spoke then about always being on. People feel like they're always on screen. So work-life unbalance, particularly leaders feeling this next point, powerlessness and impotence. So leaders feeling like actually, you know, the cavalry are out there doing the saving. And I no longer feel like I'm affecting change. I'm not doing anything. So again, warning back to the back to our um, 
our cultural norms where does this come from as leaders? Where does this notion of needing to hold power and control and feel like you're doing something important or being seen to do something, where does that come from? Is it the broader context of our culture of individualism and need for division so somebody has to win and look great? Or is it our organisational culture? Or is it our commissioning culture? Or is it all of these things? It's just to raise our awareness to the fact that sometimes leadership that isn't powerful and that isn't in control is as effective and if not more empowering for the people doing the work than the opposite. And so being careful what drives us as leaders then, if we're aware of our own needs to be powerful, to be in control, uh, maybe we might be less inclined to need to put in the things that look great organisationally, like, you know, lots of training around well-being or lots of well-being calls that actually aren't experienced as well-being calls by the staff who attend them. Um, And, you know, I had to talk about what leading in a trauma-informed way means. And I just love this notion of our architecture and how, you know, we're all made of our life experiences, our circumstances, our environments. That's how we're made. We carry it with us. We carry our childhood with us. We carry our culture with us. So if that's how we operate structurally, and the point I'm making here is, you know, we then need to find a language or the system forces us to find a language to understand the meaning of this. So the way we assess people according to their problems, you know, etc. you know all of that. So we need to assess you according to these needs to be able to get the threshold. So we have to find a language to problematize people's life experiences. But of course, that's not how trauma is experienced. Trauma is experienced multidimensionally, not just in, you know, your little toe or in your head or in your relationships or in your how you do life it's experienced multidimensionally so therefore you can't express expect it only to be resolved linguistically it's not about changing how we do assessments only it is about that but it's not only about that um it's it's the whole thing is how does it feel to be offered um help what does the environment feel like so what is the architecture upon which we are building a uh, integrated approach to helping someone? Um, what does that feel like and look like? So if we just expand that notion then, so you can see that that fits with how do we challenge ourselves to provide better services in an integrated way? That's not just about, you know, process driven um, assessments, thresholds, intervention models, which we have loads of still very dominantly. But it's also about how we work together as colleagues, what is the architecture of our organisations and how we understand what people are bringing to work with them every day. What is the architecture of our buildings or of our screen time or of our relationship and who is constructing that? So I think the point I'm making is what happens personally also happens structurally and that concept of being able to deconstruct the architecture um, fits both and should be held on both So what this is telling us is that we have unraveled vulnerability, um, both within ourselves, within our organisations, within our communities, which means that the way we have supported our communities um, and each other needs to be different than the way it was before. I had to bring up the theme of trust because this came out again and again in our conversations Um, And I think it underpins a lot of what I've been talking about if we're going to build um, different structures, so different architecture based on trust. And I think the point I want to make is that to be brave, you have to feel safe. Um, To feel safe, you have to feel trusted. And you cannot, same as purpose, you cannot just externally impose these values because you say you are. They have to be deliberately designed and embedded into your practice in the same way that somebody who is experiencing or has experienced trauma, a trauma informed approach to um, work, to life, to offering support is all about finding the safe base base and people feeling regulated enough in order to, for example, learn in the classroom or engage in the counselling, or engage in the substance misuse treatment programme. If people don't have the safe base and are able to regulate and have that integrated feeling of, uh, uh, sensory integrated feeling of their trauma, then 
they they can't um uh they can't benefit from the offer so it's the same principles all along for ourselves for our staff and for the people accessing services and to be aware of our need to be seen to be being virtuous and amazing and you know getting 27,000 likes on twitter or to be winning the big lottery contract you know the 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 need to be successful or seem to be successful we cannot underestimate that as a huge driver for us in leading public services um so can we reflect on the causal architecture so as to understand it so that you can transform that causal pr- process that I've talking about so that you can stop those destructive behavior loops that you can that we continue to see coming round and round in services that even though we have a great awareness of it we still see around us every day this requires great empathy for the people in it this is much slower but it does stop premature solutions that i believe would be more realistic and iterative but you can see how this doesn't sound very sexy what you know, this sounds quite slow, this sounds quite messy, this sounds like I would have to give up quite a lot as a leader. And are we ready to do that? I'm not sure that we are. Are we ready to be vulnerable as leaders? Who wants to be known as a vulnerable leader? It sounds like a paradox. It's easy to say we need brave leaders to, you know, charge us through the parted seas. But that, but that fearlessness will not come without the safe base. The safe base won't come without the architecture to support it. And only it's only us within the system. So remember, each player in that system, the collective creates the system. So each player in that system has a role to play in creating the architecture to create the safe base. So more reflection. So trust needs to be built in uh, safety needs to be built in reflection needs to be built in this. So, again, boring, yawn, we all know that, but we don't do it. Do we ask ourselves, what is the hard or the wicked problem we're trying to solve here? How do we, do we regularly come back to why are we doing this so that we can challenge those underlying structures and start to dismantle them just by naming them, by saying them out loud and finding a different language? How often do we reflect on our ability to hold this power and that and you know, our hierarchical structures are very set, I would say. I don't know many organisational structures that are non-hierarchical and collective in public and third sector life in Wales. So recognising that the more income and time you have, the more capacity to engage you have, and therefore the more power you have. And actually, despite all our wonderful knowledge and intention around collaboration and co-creation, is those people who are doing and doing and doing, who have less time and less capacity to engage, who are much more likely to burn out and leave the effort altogether and or deflect the process because actually they're compassion fatigued and can no longer find it within themselves to do those things that they know they should do. I just want to get the job done because I want to go home and lie down on the sofa. Thank you. None of what I'm saying you won't have already heard But the point is to really take a moment for these things to go in, that claiming that you are transparent doesn't mean that you are. Do you really reflect on what transparency is? And what we really heard in lockdown, this, you know, as I've already spoken about, that contradiction between um, we want to be seen to be dealing with uh, well-being and distress and discomfort but we don't really want to. We don't really want to sit with this because that's actually, that's too challenging. And so actually people saying, if I just had some clarity about what was happening, that would feel better to me than what feels like quite an unsafe space where where we are, are purporting to be this, but actually I don't feel like we are, so we're not. So I don't know where I am. So I feel quite insecure at work and unsafe at work. And what happens when people feel insecure and deregulated? They're not going to be doing their best, most empowering, trauma-informed work, I guarantee you. And very obvious there that, you know, the more we um, collaborate and include people, so however distressing and difficult that might be, the more people feel part of it. So it's all about balancing being and doing. And 
I think what we've heard over this uh, coronavirus time is we've this co- the collective has realised that the path to more impact is through personal development. It's about inner and outer system change. And I don't care how uh, this sounds, but it is about making space for our spiritual selves. Um, That said, you know, and this is the joy of this, our spiritual selves, but yet we want to be pragmatic. We want permission to just get on with it, to what we feel is right, is what we want to do. And remembering there is no quick win. There is no quick win. There is no single most valuable thing you can do with your time. You can take time to relate. And it's through relating that we emerge. So these are not news. These are ancient, enduring qualities that if we have purpose, if we have belonging and if we have trust, we can feel safe, connected and cared for. And that is how we can do our best leading and our best work when it comes. And so finally, my last point is about being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. And that's absolutely what we experienced in our lessons from lockdown listening, that um, it engendered very warm emotions in people that enabled them to feel connected in a way that we hadn't before. And so whilst the new innovation, innovative way is actually a very old, uh, ancient way um, of connecting each other to a bigger purpose. The end. Thank you.